Father, we thank you. We thank you for this opportunity to know more about you by digging into your word. And not only to discover who you are, but to discover who we are and what our relationship is together and what we can expect in our future and the purpose of God as it unfolds in us. Let this session together be life transformational in Jesus' name. Amen. And I believe that. I believe it's going to change your life forever to discover the entitlement that we're going to focus our attention on in this lesson. We are in chapter 9 of our glorious inheritance, the revelation of the titles of the children of God. And we're going to discover what it is to be heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. And we're going to find out not only the inheritance we have received from God, but curiously, also the inheritance we have become to God. So it's a reciprocal thing. Now, let's go to our main title scripture. Romans chapter 8, verses 16 and 17 says, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit. So you have this internal knowing, this intuitive knowledge that you're not an ordinary person. You've got this insight that there's something about your spiritual makeup that is remarkable. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Now, what does it mean to be an heir? To be an heir is to be a person who receives or is entitled to receive any properties or possessions or endowments or even qualities, characteristics passed on from a parent or a predecessor to you. You are the rightful future recipient of what is passed down from one generation to the next. Now we're going to find out that our inheritance embraces much, much more than we have ever imagined possible. Remember the scripture we just read said that we are heirs of God. Well, what have we inherited from God? We have inherited all that God has and all that God is. You can't be any more blessed than that. We've inherited all that God has and all that God is. But that seems like an utterly incredible statement. Beyond belief is what incredible means. Unless we have the awakening of this revelation from within. And that's what this prayer in Ephesians is all about. This prayer in Ephesians chapter 1 verses 17 through 19 is a prayer that on the first level Paul prayed for the Ephesian church. However... When Paul wrote this epistle, the Holy Spirit moved on him so that it was a communication not only to one individual church, but to the entire church in the age of grace. And so we can receive this not just as a prayer from Paul to one church, but as a prayer unctioned by the Holy Spirit into the life of every believer. And so let's receive this prayer as an intercession of the Holy Spirit over us who uh, who funneled this prayer through Paul toward us. And let's lay claim to it. He says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power? Now, the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to pray this prayer. But this is what I want you to understand. When we don't know how to pray, the Holy Spirit makes intercession for us, the Bible says. And I would dare to say the Holy Spirit has never prayed a prayer that the Father did not answer. So this is a done deal. This is a done deal. So right now, I want you to confess with me. By faith, I receive what's already been prayed into my life. I receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation. I receive this understanding of the hope of my calling. I receive by faith 
this revelation of the glory of the inheritance that has been deposited in me and that I have become to God and I receive by faith the exceeding greatness of the power of God that has been poured out on my life. Thank you, Father God, for doing these things. Now, if we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, for a few moments, I want to touch on the various subordinate titles, associated titles that contain the word heir, because there are individual compartments of our inheritance that we need to focus our attention on. We can talk about being heirs of God in a very general sense, or we can talk about our inheritance in a very specific sense. For instance, in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14, the writer of Hebrews is comparing sons of God to angels and referring to angels, he says, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who are or who shall be heirs of salvation? So angelic powers have been created to minister for the heirs of salvation. So you ought to confess right now, I am an heir of salvation and ministering spirits have been committed to my life in order to minister the good things of God to me. Now, what does it mean to be an heir of salvation? Well, first, we've got to discover what salvation is. And salvation is much more than a one-time trip to an altar to repent and receive forgiveness for your sins. There's about eight different Hebrew and Greek words translated salvation. And they're used in a number of different ways. It can, it, it, but it always means deliverance. It can mean deliverance from different things, but... It, that's the common denominator. It can mean deliverance from your enemies, deliverance from fear, deliverance from a backslidden state, deliverance from sickness, deliverance from satanic oppression, deliverance from sin, deliverance from death, deliverance from hell, deliverance from the grave. See, salvation has been used to mean all of these things and much more because it always means deliverance. For instance, it says to those who look for him, shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Well, somebody may say, well, I thought I was already saved. But you're saying that salvation comes when Jesus comes back again. Unto them that look for him, shall he come without sin? Shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation? No, it's the completion of this thing called salvation. Because actually it's a threefold thing. You were saved the moment you gave your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. You were saved from the penalty of sin. You are being saved on a day-to-day -day basis from the power of sin. You will ultimately be saved from the presence of sin. Never to face it again. So it's a trifold thing. Past, present, and future. You were saved from the penalty of sin. The penalty of sin was being cut off from God forever. No fellowship with God. No acceptance in his presence. But when you came to the cross, the penalty of sin was canceled. And then every day you faced temptations of the mind, turmoil in your emotions, all kinds of battles and trials and tribulations. But as sin tries to encroach on territory that now belongs to God, you are being saved from the power of sin. And greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. That's part of your inheritance. And thank God one day, not only will God save my spirit, not only will God save my soul, but God will absolutely deliver this body of corruption from the Adamic curse and bring us into a glorified state. Hallelujah. And angels are going to guard us on our journey that direction, ministering spirits that have been sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation. Also, I love this next one. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7 says, Husbands, likewise, dwell with them, with wives, with understanding. Be an understanding husband, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel. And I believe that's primarily speaking of uh, physical because sometimes women are just as strong emotionally or just as strong mentally as a man, in some cases more so. But it's talking about uh, in the majority of cases, I suppose a man normally being stronger in a physical sense, 
Husbands likewise dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life. Come on, confess it with me. Say, I am an heir of the grace of life. And the word translated life there is zoe, which means divine life, the life of God, the breath of life that has been restored to you. See, when God created Adam, he, created, he breathed into him and he became a what? A living soul. Up until that time, uh, he was not alive spiritually because that element was gone, that internal essence of the presence of God. When Adam sinned, that breath of life took its flight. Now, God doesn't breathe oxygen and nitrogen. He's talking about the breath of his own character, his nature, his essence, his being. Uh, and of course, Adam still had normal breath, the breath that you have to have to, to survive in this world, but he lost the breath of divine life. However, many thousands of years later, when Jesus stood in the upper room, he breathed on his disciples and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And days later, the Holy Spirit came like a rushing mighty wind. The wind of God is the breath of God. And he breathed into his 120 disciples exactly what Adam lost. And that all happened because of grace. We are heirs together of the grace of life. Now, I don't have time for a full exposition about what grace is and how to receive it. But I do want to cover some very important points. Number one, grace is unmerited love. Number two, grace is divinely imparted ability. Where do I get that? Well, there's two great examples. Unmerited love, where do I get that? Well, there's a great example in Zechariah's writings. It talks about how all nations will be gathered together against Jerusalem to battle in the last days, what John later on called Armageddon. And I'm talking about a nation that for the most part, for many centuries, has rejected the Messiahship of Jesus. But at their critical hour, at their critical hour, when it looks like they're going to be destroyed, the Bible says God will pour out on them the spirit of grace. That's the title for the Holy Spirit. The word is called the word of his grace. The spirit is called the spirit of grace. God is called the God of all grace, who is able to make you perfect, establish and strengthen and settle you. But anyway, uh, uh, think of that, that, that he'll pour out his love, his grace on those that for the most part have rejected him for centuries. And yet at their critical hour, as they plead for the Messiah, though they, many of them know not that it is Yeshua, Mashiach, the one who came already, he's going to reveal himself. And of course, he's going to usher in the kingdom of God and destroy those nations that came against Jerusalem to battle. That's grace. That's unmerited love. Now, what about the other definition of grace? Grace is also divinely imparted ability. Well, what did Paul say? He said, I labored more abundantly than all the other apostles, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. So he gives us the insight that grace manifests in expressed abilities, the ability to speak, to communicate, to pray for the sick, to uh, build churches, to advance the kingdom of God. He said, I am what I am by the grace of God. So it's divinely imparted ability, fused together with unmerited love. Isn't that beautiful? And uh, it's also the abundant generosity of God expressed toward us. I love uh, 2 Corinthians, what is it, 9, 8. God is able to make all grace abound towards you, abound towards you, that you having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. Well, how much grace is all grace? The best way I can express that is this. When the children of Israel went through the wilderness, there was a rock that followed them through the wilderness. And out of that rock, a river of water gushed forth. It took about 12 million gallons of water a day to sustain them in the wilderness. But I will pose a question. What if they faced a day where it was hotter than normal and it took 24 million gallons? Would there have been enough water in the rock? Of course, the answer is yes. What if they hit a dust storm and... All the kids and all the cattle and all the sheep had to be scrubbed down. And it took not 12, not 
24, but 48 million gallons of water. Would there have been enough in the rock? Of course. So what I am saying is that the supply is infinitely inexhaustible and it's always greater than the need. So when it says God is able to make all grace abound towards you, you're talking about an infinite and an infinitely inexhaustible supply. Praise God. You've got it made in the shade, I tell people, because Psalm 121 says he is your shade at your right hand and you have definitely got it made. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. Abundant generosity. Where do I get that? And what's a good example of that? 2 Corinthians 8, 9 says, You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that though he was rich for your sakes, he became poor, that you through his poverty might be made rich. He was rich in the undisturbed peace of heaven and the glory of the celestial world, but he divested himself of all those riches to assume the poverty-stricken form of human flesh. And when we connect with him at the cross where he became more bankrupt than any other time, you through his poverty are made rich. He funnels his riches into your life, the riches of righteousness and joy and peace and mercy and goodness. It all pours into your life like a river. Praise God. It's grace. It's grace. We've got to return it to him in the form of praise. Now, how do you get grace? Very quickly, let me say you have to have three main attitudes. Faith, Ephesians 2.8, by grace you're saved through faith. Humility, 1 Peter 5.5, 5, God gives grace to the humble. And sincere love for God, Ephesians 6.24, grace be with all those who love the Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. And if you maintain those three attitudes, faith, humility, sincerity, Ephesians 2.8, 1 Peter 5.5, 5, Ephesians 6, 24. If you maintain those three attitudes, I don't care if you get knocked down a hundred times, get back up again with a sincere heart of love toward God, with faith in the cross and humility before your Father, and He will restore you again and again and again on your journey home. I'm an heir of the grace of life. Hallelujah. And I'm going to rejoice about it, and I'm going to lay claim to my inheritance. Years ago, I heard a story that broke my heart. I was actually sitting in a, um, a breakfast type of restaurant like, uh, uh, well, uh, Cracker Barrel or something like that. And I was reading the newspaper and my eyes fell on a story that just captivated my mind. It captured my attention. They had found a man, it's tragic, they found a man dead in the back of this uh, dump or uh, uh, tr trash area. And uh, he had built a rudely constructed building out of old throwaway tin and rotted pieces of lumber, and he was laying on a threadbare cot, and he was emaciated, and his clothes were tattered and hanging on his body. And apparently he uh, died of malnutrition or related things. And uh, they searched his person to find out who his next of kin was and then searched the county records, and much to their surprise, they found out this man that was found in a dump was heir to over a quarter of a million dollars. Apparently, we assume, he didn't know. He could have had all the nice things of life and living in abject poverty. What's the moral of that story? There's millions of believers that live in guilt and fear and depression and discouragement, overwhelmed with life filled with uh, intrepidation over everything they face in life, not knowing that they have this awesome inheritance. They are heirs of God and join heirs with Christ, and God's abundance belongs to them. And they just haven't learned it where they can acquire it, where they can draw it into their life by faith. Well, let the opposite be true concerning you. The next heir title is... Uh, heirs of the righteousness which is by faith is found in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 7 by faith Noah being divinely warned of things not yet seen moved with godly fear so fear can be a positive motivating force moved with godly fear prepared an ark for the saving of his household isn't it an amazing thing that he's that the main thing he does with his life is he saves his family if you and I 
win our family to the Lord in the midst of this wicked world, we have done a great work and earned the right to be in the faith chapter hall of fame with Noah. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is according to faith. He believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. Just like Abraham later on, when God told him, even though he had no child, and Sarah was barren, he said, look up to the sky, look at the stars, so shall your seed be. He believed God, and the Bible said God counted it to him for righteousness. We'll get to that in just a moment. The story of Abraham. So there is a kind of righteousness that comes in response to faith. Romans 5, 17 says we have received the gift of righteousness. But you're not going to receive a gift unless you believe in it enough to reach out, grasp it, and bring it to yourself. If you don't know you have the gift of righteousness, you're going to spin your wheels in the ditch of religion, and I'm talking even Christian religion, always trying to measure up, always trying to be good enough, always trying to fulfill uh, this commandment, that commandment, this mandate, that mandate, this rule, that rule, this regulation, that regulation, in order to somehow feel worthy of a relationship with God. Well, I'm not saying to be lawless, because I do believe in living a holy life, and I do believe in living by the commandments of God. And I'm not talking the 613 commandments in the Torah, I'm talking the 1,050 commandments in the New Testament. We are not free from commandments. However, our righteousness hinges not on human performance, but on Jesus' performance, what he did on the cross. And because he became sin for us, wow. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, God made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. I dare you to do it. I dare you to confess I am the righteousness of God. That sounds a little audacious, doesn't it? How could I know me and how could I have the audacity to say I am the righteousness of God? Only God can say that. No, it's a gift. It's a gift to you. The scripture says, if you confess with your lips the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved, Romans 10, 8 through 10. For with the heart man believes, for with the mouth confession is made unto salvation, and with the heart man believes unto righteousness. So righteousness is something you believe your way into, something you receive by faith. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Jesus started his ministry unveiling this mystery. So if you're filled with righteousness, that's something outside of you coming into you, not something within your life that you work out. Well, who does that? You're the fill, filly. God is the filler. God fills you with his own righteousness. And you become a container of the righteousness of God. And that's why you inherit the right to use that entitlement. If I were to ask someone for a Coke, now I don't drink Cokes. I think they're very destructive to the human body. But uh, just for sake of example, if I said to somebody, I'm thirsty, would you go over there and get that Coke and bring it to me? Would you go over and pour the liquid into your hand and bring it to me for me to slurp it up? Because technically, the liquid is the Coke, not the bottle. Or would you bring me the bottle with the liquid in it? And the bottle's got the name on the outside of it, Coca-Cola. Because the bottle inherits the name of the liquid it's filled with. So also, the sons and daughters of God inherit the name of what they are filled with. He is the filler, you are the filly. He has filled you with his righteousness, and you are an heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Come on, lift your hand and say, I claim my inheritance. I claim being just as righteous in the sight of the Father, in the sight of heaven, as Jesus, the firstborn son. Because I believe in the cross, and I believe in the open tomb. Praise God. The next 
heir title is heirs of promise. And it's found in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 17, 18, and 19. Uh, and this is actually talking about God's commitment to Abraham, God's promise to Abraham. And it says, thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise, the immutability of his counsel. The word immutability means the unchangeableness. The immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie. First, God cannot lie. That's one of the five things he cannot do. He cannot lie. He cannot fail. He cannot change. There's five things he cannot do. And also on top of that, he swore by himself. So he can't lie, and then he confirms it by an oath. In order to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise, the immutability of his counsel, he confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope that is set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, which enters into the presence beyond or behind the veil. So my hope is like an anchor that I have thrown beyond the veil of time on into eternity, and it's lodged behind the veil of the Holy of Holies, in the highest realm of heaven. And it will get me home one day through all the storms of life because I am an heir of promise. Now this is referring to a passage of scripture where God gave an awesome promise to Abraham. Uh, now remember in, let's see, it's in Genesis chapter 22. Uh, at this time, Isaac has grown up probably, we don't know for sure, Probably he's in his mid-teens. And God requests or demands the unthinkable. He says, Abram, take your, Abraham, take your son, your only son, and offer him up on one of the mountains that I will tell you of. And God led him to Mount Moriah, which would later on be the site of the temple of God. So all of that was interconnected, and God was laying the foundation symbolically and prophetically for something to come because the death of Abraham's son was going to be the foundation of what would bring forth the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in the temple of God many, many years later. So it's all a picture of what's actually going to happen in the new covenant. Isn't God a genius at weaving all these things together? So anyway, when uh, Abraham is ready to fulfill God's charge, and he's got the knife poised above his head. Right at the critical moment, God comes through. And isn't that usually when God does it? That's usually when God finally brings your breakthrough. Right, right when you get to the point where you can't go any further, God shows up. And right at that moment, the angel of the Lord spoke to Abraham out of heaven. Out of heaven? Well, that's a long way off. No, it's right here. It's just a little bit higher realm but it's not a far distance physically speaking. It's just a transcendent realm that is in, occupying the same space as the physical universe. But anyway, the angel of the Lord, who is the angel of the Lord? That's a term for the pre-incarnate Christ. Uh, the Hebrew word malach is translated angel. It's also translated messenger. And the Messiah to come is called the malach or the messenger of the covenant. He's the angel of the Lord. And uh, whenever God speaks or manifests himself under the old will, that's the pre-incarnate Christ. He's the eternal word. He's always been the manifestation of the Godhead that way. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, By myself have I sworn. Now, God didn't have to swear because what he says is never... Uh, weakened by any uh, distortion of meaning or dishonesty or in, uh, uh, elaborating or enhancing what he says with some untruth. Everything he says is absolute truth, absolutely dependable. And yet he adds an oath 
And he says, by myself have I sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, that blessing I will bless you and multiply and I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. And your descendants shall possess the gates the gate of their enemies. So this is what Hebrews 6, 17 through 19 is talking about. It's how God swore to Abraham that he would bless Isaac's seed and they would become like the stars in heaven and they would possess the gate of their enemies. In other words, they would conquer the land of Canaan many years later. Praise God. And of course, that bumps up to a spiritual level of... Uh, fulfillment for us because our enemies are not Canaanites. Our enemies are the satanic spirits that fill this world that try to build strongholds in our lives personally, in our families, in our cities, in our communities, in our nations. And yet we as the church of the living God can storm the gates of the strongholds of the enemy and tear them down in our own hearts and lives, in our families, in our communities, in our world. Praise God for that. We are heirs of promise. There are 7,487 promises in God's word. Think of that. Other scriptures like Galatians 4.28 refer to us as children of promise. We are heirs of promise and children of promise. If you're a child of something, you owe your existence to that. I'm a child of Andrew and Winnie Shreve, so I owe my existence physically and soulishly to them. Well, if I'm a child of promise, I owe my existence spiritually to the promises of God. I acted on promises. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. I acted on that promise. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. I acted on the promise of spiritual rebirth. And that's why I came into existence as a son of God. I'm an heir of promise because all the 7,487 promises in God's word belong to me, but I will share them with you also. You can have them as well. We're equal heirs. You cannot tell me a problem that I can't give you a promise to match. And, and that promise is always more powerful than the problem. And I could go through a whole long list Fear, God has not given you a spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind. Depression, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Anxiety, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God that passes understanding shall keep your heart and your mind through Christ Jesus. Weakness, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Sickness in your body, with his stripes you were healed. Uh, problems financially. I wish above all things that you would prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. The grave out ahead of you. Jesus said, he that believes on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. There is nothing that you can face in this life, in this world, where there's not a promise powerful enough, mighty enough to carry you through the problem to sure victory on the other side. Come on, somebody shout it out. Say, I am a child of promise. I am an heir of promise. Praise God. This is part of my inheritance. I lay hold to it. I seize it. All 7,487 promises come into being, come into manifestation through faith. We obtain promises by faith, it says in Hebrews 11. So start believing enough to thank God as if it's a done deal, not beg God for something he's already promised to do in your life. All right, we're also called in Titus 3.7, heirs according to the hope of eternal life, that being justified by his grace, and the word justified means legally acquitted of all guilt, just as if you never sinned. That being justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Well, that means two things, really. It means, number one, that we are heirs of eternal life, and you can't inherit anything better than that. That's the greatest gift of all. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. If the worst things that could happen to you in life happen to you, but you're still an heir of eternal life, you've got reason to shout. You've got reason to be joyous. You've got reason to... Uh, to tell others you're victorious because everything the world throws at you is not strong enough to rob you of this gift of eternal life. 
praise God, as long as you yield to the gift giver. Mm. And then it says that we become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So eternal life is like the measure of our inheritance. So eternal life is the greatest thing that you could ever hope for as a temporal human being destined for the grave, stalked by death, walking through the valley of the shadow of death. You could hope for other things, a house, lands, children, money, possessions, but those things pale in comparison to the most important thing we all need, and that is some way out of this trap of death. And if we can hope for the highest and hope for the greatest of all gifts, which is eternal life, then we are heirs according to that hope. We can fill up the whole measure of our inheritance all the way up to the peak, which is eternal life itself. Also, this is going to amaze you, and I think it may change your thinking on something dramatically. Romans 4.13, talking about Abraham and his seed. Now, let me insert a little thought here. The Bible said that by faith we are children of Abraham. We which believe become children of Abraham. And so, spiritually speaking, we have inherited the legacy that Abraham has passed down, the inheritance that Abraham has passed down to his offspring. We, uh, we which believe are blessed with, uh, uh, with faithful Abraham. So we receive the blessing of Abraham in our life. In fact, Jesus thought it was so important that he became a curse for this transfer to take place. Galatians 3, 13 and 14 said uh, that he became a curse for us. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might pass on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. So when we're grafted in to Jesus, when we come into the vine, we become branches on the vine. He said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Automatically, we are grafted into Israel because he was the perfect product of Israel that sent out the uh, opportunity into all the nations of the world to unite with the vine uh, of what God is doing in this world. And, uh, and so this promise that I'm about to quote passes to you. It says that the promise, speaking of Abraham, the promise that he would be the heir of the world, the heir of the world, was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. In other words, he didn't become the heir of the world, he, world because he measured up to the law because the law was not given yet. That was not introduced until Moses came many years later. But because Abraham heard from God, acted on what God said, believed what God said, then he became an heir. He became an heir not only of the land of promise, but of the entire world. Now, is that our inheritance as well? Yes, Jesus said, the third beatitude, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And if you go to Psalm 37, verse 9, verse 11, verse 22, over and over again, it talks about this promise that we will inherit the earth. We will inherit the earth. We will inherit the world. See, so many people think that our whole future purpose is dying and going to heaven and staying in heaven the rest of our existence. No, that's not right. Heaven is a temporary stage for those who are dead in Christ. Those who die, the, uh, the Bible clearly says, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, and that's in a conscious state. I do not believe in soul sleep. You are consciously in the presence of God in a soulish form when you die. However, those that sleep in Jesus, God will bring with him at the return of Christ. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. A resurrection takes place where our soul and our spirits, our souls and our spirits are rejoined to our bodies. And so we become complete and perfected as a triune being. Well, if we're already in heaven, already in the presence of God, why do we need to be resurrected in our physical bodies? Because you have to have a body for the realm you're ordained for. 
And our ultimate ordination is to rule and reign in this world in a restored paradise where the kingdom of God envelops this planet. And so we have to have glorified bodies to function in a glorified world. That's just the way God's decided to do it. Who are we to question it or try and figure it out? I'm just glad to be a part of his plan unfolding. Then finally, James 2.5 gives us a beautiful promise. It says, listen, my beloved brethren, has not God chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he has promised to those who love him? Now, what does it mean to be an heir of the kingdom of God? How far reaching is that? What does that include? Well, the kingdom of God, well, break it into two parts, is the king's domain. It's everything over which he rules, everything that is submitted to his kingship. The kingdom of God uh, came and manifested in the ministry of Jesus Christ. That's why constantly he was echoing John the Baptist's statement, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then uh, when, when a, uh, a mute and deaf uh, boy spoke and heard again, Jesus said, the kingdom of God has come upon you. The kingdom of God has come upon you. Because at that time, the way had not been made yet for the kingdom to enter within them. That didn't happen until the blood was shed on the cross of Calvary. But from the time the king came into this world, he was manifesting his supernatural spiritual kingdom among men. That kingdom, well, Paul told us what the kingdom is by telling us what it's not. He said the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. He's not talking about human joy. He's not talking about human love. He's not talking about human peace. He's not talking about human righteousness. He's talking about supernatural joy, supernatural peace, supernatural righteousness, a supernatural love that surpasses knowledge. That's what permeates the kingdom. And if you are an heir of the kingdom, all of this is part of your inheritance. You don't have to ask God for joy. You've got joy. You don't have to ask God for peace. You've got peace. You don't have to ask God for righteousness. You have it at your disposal. And the love of God has already been prayed into your life. Check out John chapter 17. Jesus prayed for all the church to come. And he said that the love, Father, wherewith you have loved me may be in them. You ought to say, I receive it right now. I receive the love of the Father pouring into my heart right now. And that's part of inheriting the kingdom. Another scripture Paul gave he said, the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. Jesus sent out his disciples to, uh, to all the cities he planned to visit. 35 teams of two disciples visiting the various places that Jesus was going to come and preach. And he said, you go preach the kingdom of God. In other words, you go preach that, that God can rule and reign among men and he can take authority over natural limitations and hindrances and problems and battles and manifest his sovereign power in this world. That's in essence what he was saying. You go preach the kingdom of God and then he said, follow it up with a performance. Heal the sick, cast out devils, open the eyes of the blind, open the ears of the deaf, freely you've received, now freely give. So the kingdom of God is not just a high-flying concept. It's not just some philosophical view, some theological idea. It's real, living, practical power that can supernaturally change you forever. It can heal your bodies, deliver your souls, bring calmness to your mind, fix your broken, messed up heart, fix your messed up, confused life. The power of God can change it all. And you're an heir of the kingdom. There's nothing in the kingdom but that which is good, that which is perfect, that which is wondrous and beautiful and reflects the very character of the king who rules that kingdom. You're a part of that kingdom if you've been born again. So you ought to lift your voice and right now say, I claim my inheritance. I claim the kingdom of God. Well, that's what Jesus said to pray. 
He said, when you pray, pray, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. That's not so much a plea as it is an affirmation. When you say your kingdom come, your will be done, you're affirming that that is the will of God and you're vocalizing it so that it can be released. I don't believe you're asking God for something he's already done. The kingdom came with power on Pentecost. He told his disciples, there's some of you standing here that will not taste of death until the kingdom of God comes with power. Bam, it came like a Russian mighty wind. It's been in the world ever since. So you don't ask God for something he's already done. You do affirm and release it into manifestation when you make that declaration, that decree. You actually declare the decree. The decree for the kingdom to come has already been made by the king. But you as his emissary declare the decree. You declare thy kingdom come, thy will be done. I say that almost every time I go into the pulpit. And it's my way of saying, God, let your kingdom power permeate the atmosphere. Let the sick be healed, the oppressed be delivered, the lost be saved. And let God's kingdom take over the lives of the people. Praise God. Now, we are also referred to as joint heirs with Christ. Joint heirs with Christ. So if I'm a joint heir, to me, that means an equal heir. A joint heir is an equal heir. I have inherited what Jesus, the firstborn son, has inherited because he shares it with me and he shares it with you. Well, in order to find out what my inheritance is then, I've got to find out what Jesus inherited. Let's go to scripture. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things. Now that means all things in the natural universe, in the natural cosmos, the multitude of galaxies, a hundred million billion stars and planets in the Milky Way, and then millions of billions of galaxies swirling through the universe. And it's all his inheritance. He's an heir of all things, but not just the physical universe, the celestial world as well. There's nothing outside of the umbrella of his authority. The Father appointed the Son to be heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. Well, I could never claim that awesome an inheritance. Uh, how dare I even think it? Well, yes, I do dare to think it. Because corporately, along with the body of Christ, I lay hold to Revelation 21, verse 7. That's the verse that proclaims he who overcomes. Overcomes what? This world and all of its evil, all of its traps, all of its deceptions. He who overcomes shall inherit all things. So what belongs to Jesus? Dare to say, it belongs to me. Wow, what a future you've got. Come on, what a destiny is unfolding before you. Life is a whole lot bigger than the picayunish problems that rob us of peace. Little puny difficulties, a broken down washing machine, a, a, a neighbor that's giving you a hard time, a boss that's mean to you. Come on, Look past all these little pressure points and see the awesomeness of your future. You are heirs of all things. Let's go a little further with this. The Bible says Jesus inherited all fullness. Fullness. Colossians 1.19, the Bible says it pleased the Father that in him all fullness should dwell. So he was filled with the knowledge of God filled with the wisdom of God, filled with the love of God, filled with the peace of God, filled with the power of God, filled with the majesty of God. Everything the Father was, was deposited in the Son. Colossians 2.9, for in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. But that's Jesus, that's not me, I know me. I know my past. I know what I've come out of. I know the battles I go through mentally and emotionally. Yes, I can celebrate that in Jesus, but not me. Oh, yes, you. 
Listen to John chapter 1, verse 16. Of his fullness we have all received. If he received the fullness of all that the Father was deposited into him, and now Jesus, Colossians, what is it? Uh, uh, um, Ephesians, rather, 3, 17 that Jesus Christ will dwell in your hearts by faith. If the fullness of the Godhead is within him and he is within you, the fullness of the Godhead in seed form resides within you. Oh, maybe you don't feel it completely now. Maybe you don't sense it or see its manifestation completely now. It's in seed form. Show me an acorn. Cut it open. Smash it. Bust it open. See if you can show me a huge tree with limbs and, and, and leaves and acorns. Of course not. It's just a white pulpy substance. But hidden down in that acorn is the essence that will one day bring a mighty oak tree bursting out of the ground one little growth spurt at a time. There's an essence in you of an inheritance which is the fullness of the Godhead. We are his many brethren, according to Romans 8, 29. And back it up, one verse that says, All things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. We are his many brethren, chosen with him in the beginning and destined to be like him in the end. Let me give you a tremendous passage of Scripture Hebrews chapter 2, verse 11 says, For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Now, if he's not ashamed to call you brethren, don't you be ashamed to position yourself in this glorious inheritance that he's given you. Don't be ashamed of it. Dare to say it. Dare to speak it. Dare to lay hold to it. Because he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all of one. One translation says we are all of one origin. We are all of one source. We are all of one origin. What does that mean? Well, he who sanctifies, the word sanctified means to, be, to, uh, to set apart unto God and to cleanse from the defilement of sin. Well, that's what he did in our lives when he sanctified us. He set us apart, consecrated us to God, and cleansed us from the defilement of sin. And we who are sanctified, we who are set apart and cleansed, can trace our roots all the way back to the same source as the one who sanctified us, the Lord Jesus Christ. And what is that source? In Ephesians chapter 1, what is that, I think? Verse 4 says, we are chosen in him, in Christ, in the sanctifier. We are chosen in him before the foundation of the world. So the very plan that dictated the death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and kingship and enthronement of the Lord Jesus Christ is the same plan that has dictated you be crucified with Christ, buried with Christ, resurrected with Christ, ascended with Christ, seated with Christ in heavenly places, and enthroned with him forever. You're going to make it. You're going to survive. You're of one origin and one destiny. And you've got an inheritance that will prevail. Now, there's some other joint heir principles that I want to cover before we finish out this class. Notice the phrase, all things. Notice the phrase, all things. Everything the Son of God knows and everything the Son of God has is highlighted in these two scriptures. John 15, verse 15. Jesus says, no longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master does. But I have called you friends. Wow, you're the friend of God. Moses, the Bible said, was a friend of God. He spoke to God face to face as a man speaks with his friend. Abraham was referred to in Scripture as the friend of God. But now it's not just two notable individuals, heroes of the faith, that occupy that role, but every disciple of the New Testament era. He says, I don't call you servants. That's part of what you are and part of what you do. That title of servant does rest upon you. But he said, there's a higher calling. I call you friends. For the servant does not know what his master does, but I have called you friends for all things. Everybody say all things. 
Come on, repeat it out loud. All things, all things that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. So you're a recipient of revelation knowledge. He told Peter, who do men say that I am? Some say you're Elijah. Some say you're a great prophet risen from the dead. But who do you say that I am? You're the Messiah. You're the Mashiach. You're the Christ, the son of the living God. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. And then he said a little later, on this rock will I build my church, the rock of divine revelation. And he says, everything the Father reveals to me, I've revealed it to you. That's our inheritance, revelation knowledge. Praise God. And then in John chapter 16, verse 15, he says, all things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he will take of mine and will declare it to you. Well, the comforter comes, the parakletos, the Holy Spirit, the helper comes in order to open the treasury of all that Jesus possesses as the firstborn son of God and then reveals it to you because the treasure belongs to you as well. All things, all things the Father has made known, all things that the Father has belong to us. As joint heirs, members of the church are also called not only to receive what Jesus had inherited, but to receive his responsibilities on earth. He said in John 14, verse 12, Most assuredly I say to you, or in the King James, Verily, verily I say unto you, and actually in the original language, if it's rendered exactly, it would be, Amen, amen, I say unto you. Whenever you find verily, verily, uh, uh, and it's a, a repeated word, normally in the New Testament it's the word, Amen. Amen, amen, I say to you, which means absolute assurance. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works I do, shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go to my Father. He didn't say greater works than these shall they do. So it's not talking about greater in quantity. I, I have explained myself in times past that when Jesus gave the scripture, he could have been saying greater works because the body of Christ would be worldwide in every nation uh, and there would be millions of vessels in which he would dwell through which he could perform his work so it would be greater in number. But he's talking in a singular sense here. He says, most assuredly I say to you, he who, not they, but he who believes in me, the works I do, he will do also and greater works than these he will do because I'm, I, go, I go to my Father. Well, as far as I can see it, the only work that I can do that would be greater than what the Lord Jesus did when he was on the earth is lead someone to the cross where they can be washed free from their sin. He healed their bodies and he forgave their sin, but he couldn't completely cleanse them of their sin until the blood was shed. That's the greater work that we are now empowered to do this. Part of my inheritance, my inheritance is sharing with others the opportunity for redemption and reconciliation. So we inherit not only his abilities, but his responsibilities. And let me end with Matthew chapter 11, verse 29. Jesus says, uh, prior to that, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. And you shall find rest for your souls. A, a yoke. A yoke is an instrument you put on two draft animals like cows or oxen or mules to pull a wagon or to pull a plow to do work. And he says, take my yoke upon you to rest, to enter into rest. That doesn't make sense to the natural mind. But it's more restful to work for God than it is to do nothing physically of any value to the kingdom. So uh, you, you can be uh, sitting on a beach doing nothing but not attempting to accomplish anything for the kingdom and have less rest than that saint of God that is busily doing something to bless and enlarge the church of the living God. He says, take my yoke upon you. So if you're yoked with Jesus, any animals that are yoked together have to go the same speed, the same direction. And there's always a lead mule or a lead animal 
that, uh, that the other one follows. Well, Jesus, for instance, is the lead mule in a sense. And we follow his step. We go the speed he goes. We go the direction he goes. If we're really true disciples, we don't do in life what we want to do in life. We follow his leading. And that's where we find rest for our souls. And also, to be yoked with Jesus means not only do we act, but we react the same way he would. So if in a certain circumstance he would forgive, then those that are yoked with him forgive also. If in a certain circumstance he would show love instead of hate, then those who are yoked with him would show love instead of hate also. If in a certain circumstance he would demonstrate mercy instead of judgment, then those yoked with him will be merciful also. This is part of our inheritance, inheriting not only his abilities, but his responsibilities, not only his nature and the blessing of who he is and what he has, but inheriting the responsibility of acting and reacting in this world the same way he would if he was here. All right, let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, this is just marvelous. This is phenomenal. This is mind-boggling that we are heirs of God and join heirs with Christ. Let us lay hold to this in practical ways and manifest it in our lives in the week to come. In Jesus' name, amen. Join us in the next session. This is going to get really, really deep.